Hello, and a very warm welcome to you. Uh, uh, my name is Penny Taylor. It's my great privilege to be uh, your anchor for this webinar, which is exploring the findings from the Health Foundation's Review of Health Inequalities in Scotland. Um, this is a piece of work that's been taking place over the past year, and uh, the report it makes impactful reading. It's called Leave No One Behind. And I think we'll be posting links to the report for those of you that haven't seen it yet. Um, I, so we, we have, I think, around about 1,100 people registered for this webinar, which is a really fantastic number and I think demonstrates the passion that there is to do something about health inequalities in Scotland. So let me run through how people can get involved because it's really important. We really want to hear from you all the way through the next hour and a quarter. You have, because this is Zoom, various icons at the bottom of your screen. One of them is Q&A. If you click on that, it brings up a box. If you have any questions that you want to put to the people that we'll be talking to, please do so there. We also have the chat function. If you click on that, it opens up another box where you uh, can post any links, any comments and make contact with individuals. Uh, we also have closed captioning, uh, which can be enabled again through an icon at the foot of your screen. And just to let you know, in terms of the housekeeping, that we're recording this session and the recording will be available on the Health Foundation website from this time tomorrow or thereabouts. So uh, we, we can we share this more widely. We're also using a hashtag on Twitter, hashtag his. HIS Review 23. So please, um, please use that. Uh, we have uh, already, you know, a few uh, pointers up in the chat, but if anyone would like to tell us where you're joining us from, please do so and we can get the interaction going. If questions come up that you wish you'd asked, you can upvote them and that will bring those to our attention. So over the course of the next wee while, we're gonna be hearing from the Reviews Expert Advisory Group Chair, Chris Cregan, from David Finch, who's the Assistant Director of Healthy Lives at the Health Foundation. And we're also joined by a panel uh, comprising Linda Bold, Chief Social Policy Advisor at the Scottish Government and very familiar to those of us that followed um, the COVID briefings regularly not so long ago. Uh, we also have Mubin Huck, who is the Chief Executive of uh, the Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust. We can come to him with any points that, that, that are appropriate there. And last but by no means least, Michael Kellett, Director of Strategy, Government, Governance and Performance at Public Health Scotland. So welcome to all of you. As you will see, we already have quite a few notifications of where people are joining us from. Clyde Bank, East Ayrshire, uh, gosh, Edinburgh, Lanarkshire, all over the shop, even some from England. Welcome to you all. So I wonder if I can start by introducing Chris Cregan. Chris, this has been a really important piece of work. It's the first look at what's been happening to inequalities in Scotland post pandemic. Did anything in particular surprise you about a piece of work. So, <clears throat> morning, uh, Penny. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, so, I, I guess I, a very short answer, and then a bit of explanation um, for the short answer. Um, surprise me? No, um, sadly not. Um, uh, there were others involved in the in the expert advisory group who were far more steeped in the data prior to the uh, review than I was. But I did have a sense of the broad picture of what's been happening in Scotland, not just recently, but over the last two decades. 
and that sense was confirmed rather than contradicted. Um, but I think I want to qualify that and I want to say that lack of surprise should not be taken for a lack of kind of shock and shockingness, if you like, because much of what this report sets out is shocking. And when you read it, and I was reading it again last night and again this morning, you have to catch your breath. Um, and I think for me, uh, the standout, and there's lots that I could draw on in that respect, but the standout in that respect is the plight of those in Scotland's least, um, in most deprived uh, areas, specifically the, the bottom fifth. Um, so what we see is a widening gap in health between people in the most deprived fifth of areas and the rest of the population over the last decade. And the sense that the fortunes of those people are not only increasingly detached from the rest of the population, um, but also in many, case, in many cases from the, the fourth quintile. So just a note of caution before I stop and pass back to you, um, Penny, here. Um, inequality in relation to protected characteristics doesn't necessarily map neatly onto area-based deprivation. Um, so I think that's an important qualification. But nevertheless, I think for me, it was a kind of standout um, uh, finding. Um, and so that is shocking. It is alarming. And along with it, for me, is a sense that that detachment, it's not abstract. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. So that if we don't act, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, if we don't use our agency to act, actually what we're doing is, is setting those people adrift. Um, so doing nothing or even not doing enough is not neutral. OK, thank you very much. It's uh... We'll come back to uh, discussing more of those findings, but I think first let's hear um, from David Finch. Give us a, a taste of the report, will you? And just a reminder to anyone joining us, it's wonderful to make contact with you and to see that we've got people joining us from right across Scotland and Northern Ireland as well has joined in. Hello, Northern Ireland. Um, uh, please put any questions that you might have in the Q&A column and we will come to those. But just to inform this discussion, David Finch. Okay. Thank you, Penny. So I'm going to, I think some slides will appear very, very soon. They're, they're coming up now. So um, I was going to give you a very short overview of our report. I didn't want to sort of take up the entire session going through all of it. So this is really pulling out a few of the major themes um, there's a lot more in the full report, so do please um, take a look at that. And actually, there's even more in each of the reports by our research partners, which help to inform this work. Um, so please do sort of take a look at those if you haven't already as well. Um, there's lots and lots in there, and inevitably, I, I can't really do full justice to it in about what's hopefully about five minutes. Um, I was going to give um, start off with highlighting some of the trends and health and determinants of health. Um, over the last two decades, and then end on um, a few, I suppose, points as to how we can make progress in future. And hopefully, that's something we'll explore further in the um, the rest of the session. Um, so, if we um, if we move to the first chart there, then I think um, these are two kind of standout um, trends that really characterise um, the last two decades with these two kind of really distinct periods and changes to health and and living standards. Um, the chart on the left is showing period life expectancy. Um, the dashed line is the kind of pre-2012 trend if it had continued. And um, the solid line beyond that point is showing how um, improvements in life expectancy had stalled so significantly since 2012. Um, the very large drop at the end there is reflecting, is largely reflecting COVID um, and the pandemic. But the, the main point is that we had this kind of rapid period of improvement through the, the first half of the decade, and that's quickly or well, that, that went into a period of stagnation. Um, and then almost in, in a kind of parallel um, trend, when we look at um, earnings growth, so um, kind of wage growth for the typical earner, um, there's also this kind of period of stagnation starting slightly earlier, but it's a very kind of similar trend. And I think that really marks those two, um, that shift from going from quite rapid growth and improvements in living standards and also health um, into a, a second decade of, or the last decade, which has been more of um, a lack of improvement, um, is really in both. Um, I mean, it's not to say there's a direct causality between the, 
the two, but we do know the importance of living standards to our health. So I think at the very least, it suggests that um, that kind of current wage stagnation will act as a drag on future health improvements. And obviously that, um, that period of wage stagnation is reflective of a wider period of austerity following the um, financial crisis, where we also see um, public services very stretched as well um, and becoming ever more fragile. Um, but when we looked um, beneath those headline measures, which on the, the following slide, um, I think the, the trend of most concern, and this reflects, um, as Chris was saying, is that across a range of indicators, the health of people living in, in what were the most deprived 20% of areas in Scotland um, are being seen to start to fall behind the rest. I think, um, as, as Chris said, um, you know, this isn't necessarily the perfect measure, but it is one that we tend to have available um, across a range of data sources and time. So at least it allows for some consistent comparisons. There is more in-depth analysis using different ways of, of looking at inequalities um, within the report by, um, by our, our, the team at the University of Glasgow um, that produced a report for us. Um, but essentially what this, what this chart is showing is um, the, the change in drug deaths over the last decade. And, and this is perhaps the most stark um, trend of all, um, which is why we're kind of highlighting it here. And it's really clear how that most deprived fifth of um, the drug death rates there have just increased so much more rapidly than in other areas. Um, and that gap has grown between the most deprived um, people living in the most deprived areas and, and the rest. I think perhaps of a, of a further concern is particularly um, on this indicator is how that, that second most deprived 20% is also starting to move away from the rest slightly. Um, I think another, another key indicator, just to sort of try and highlight this trend on the next slide, um, is is looking at infant mortality rates, where actually there was an improvement um, up until around 2015 across different parts of, across different levels of deprivation. Um, but from about 2015, we've seen there's a noticeable shift in trend where actually infant mortality rates have started to rise um, in the most deprived areas, but they've continued improving or gone flat in other areas. Um, so again, it's another indication of how this, um, the, the most deprived fifth have been moving away from the rest and it's not always that there is no overall improvement or there's no, there hasn't been um, a, a narrowing of inequalities in the past, but it's this is happening more in the most recent decade. Um, and, and you see this trend again and again. Um, and we also focused on looking at some of the, um, the social and economic factors that are really important to shaping our health, things like work, income and housing. Um, and here, I think in a, in a very quick summary way, um, they, Overall, it provides little indication that um, either these inequalities will close in future or that there will be um, a general kind of improvement in, in health. And that partly reflects that wage stagnation we spoke about at the start. But also when we look at other indicators on the um, on the next chart, um, and this is just, again, picking one of many um, aspects that have been looked at here. Um, there has been there is there has been a gradual rise in poverty um, since around 2010. Um, and it's particularly for children, um, which is the, that top line. And then when we've looked at a measure of extreme poverty, which is um, people further away from the normal poverty line that's looked at, so even lower income, um, those trends are, are actually stronger, and which suggesting that there is this kind of rising, um, rising extreme poverty, um, again, situated towards the kind of bottom end of the income distribution, which isn't a perfect parallel to the, um, to deprivation, but it's certainly um, something in line with those with those findings. Um, but I think it is. I think we've also tried to look for um, reasons for optimism within this work. And I think, despite these trends, um, I think it's important to say that um, worsening health, you know, and wider inequalities aren't inevitable. There was progress in the decade, in the in the two thousands, um, and there's certainly um, within Scotland a really clear historic policy intent to try and tackle these issues. Um, so what we really wanted to also understand is what was getting in the way of, of greater progress. Um, clearly there are wider fiscal constraints that may, um, <clears throat> that may act as a drag, but there's also certainly kind of will and, um, and funding to, um, to do more and make a bit of a difference. So we wanted to understand why is there a gap between policy intent del delivery and people's experiences, um, which if we can go to the next slide, um, I've very tried to very briefly summarise these. There's quite a lot within these still, um, but we 
we um, we worked with Nesta Scotland to speak to stakeholders, um, largely focused on the kind of third sector and delivery areas, to understand what was getting in the way of of delivery and what was causing this implementation gap. Um, and these are some of the kind of core themes that came out of that, which were around the need to adapt, adopt a longer term approach and not just um, staying having a short termist approach to policy making. Um, Restoring some trust that had broken down within different people acting within the policy system um, and helping to um, bring more, empower communities more to have more of a voice in the policies that are being developed so that those solutions are kind of applied to them. Um, there's a need to learn more from and, and build greater evaluation and scrutiny of what's being done and what's being what's been done in the past and what's been successful and what, what hasn't been successful and then make and, and then improve policy in future. And also to, um, to get better at taking those things that have worked and encourage more people to try different approaches and, and spread that across, the, um, across parts of Scotland and, and across different policy areas so that we can see faster progress. Um, again, that's quite a brief overview of that, I think. Um, what our work also showed is um, we, we did some work, deliberative work with the public and that showed that actually there was there is support for taking this type of longer term approach to policy making rather than focusing on quite short term goals, um, which we think also points to um, a, a kind of support for taking this type of approach and some optimism that it can be that it can happen in future. Um, and that's something that we, um, you know, we didn't set out to make really detailed recommendations, but try and point to a kind of path for how to take action in future because we recognize that for that to really work, it needs um, the people involved in, in delivering on those policies to collaborate together and come up with those solutions. And that's um, people collaborating across all parts of society from central government to the public. And this is something um, that after having, um, after we've had this review period and this evidence gathering, we're really hoping to um, support that pro process of making progress on health and health inequalities in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, sobering reading. A reminder, I think, that the health inequalities problems in Scotland predate the pandemic, but obviously the, the impact of the last few years is going to be um, harsh. I'm going to go to our panel next and just get very quick responses. Thank you so much to really brilliant questions and comments that are coming through. We're going to try and theme those. But let me just get, you know, Linda Bold, can I start with you, your response to this report? Well, first of all, to thank the Health Foundation and equally importantly, the many teams that were involved. I think it's really worth reading all the reports if you have time and I can see on the participant list, Penny, that many of the co-authors have joined us. It's an outstanding piece of work. And I think um, in my academic role, I'm heading back in to teach medical students public health next week and to try and communicate some of this to them is just so powerful. So thank you. So I wear two hats. Um, I'm a chair of public health at the University of Edinburgh and have a long-standing interest in health inequalities and also chief social policy advisor, as you said. And there I'm not advising on uh, health or the health service. I'm advising on child poverty, inequalities and the issues that we're grappling with. And although I think the report highlights for me, um, you know, there are, there are some positive messages in here around some of the progress that, that Scotland has made, including in one of the most harmful causes of inequalities, the area I've traditionally worked in, which is tobacco. Um, that is still a success story, although there are huge inequalities. But I think as we talk about COVID recovery, which is what we're all working on now, you know, the, the impact, what this report says to me is that the impact of the last 10, 15 years and a period of austerity has caused huge harm to the Scottish population. And I think it's a big ask for governments to try and address all of that. I think what we have to do in my government role is do as much as we can, particularly on child poverty and early years, which the report really underlines, but also to think about how we can work together across sectors more effectively. And again, as the report highlights, we don't always do that well. And so those are the two things. Let's really focus on prevention and the early years. And secondly, Let's try and work together to reverse some of this. It's an international problem. Scotland's not alone, but as, as is highlighted, we have some of the biggest challenges 
in comparable countries. So thank you to everyone involved. Thank you. And I think we've got a message in a Q&A from Jonathan Scher um, of QNIS, basically, you know, highlighting the pre-pregnancy importance of the field that you were talking about, Linda, there. So we'll, we'll come back and pick those up. But I wanted to go now, if I may, to Mubin Hack. Mubin, you were on the, uh, on the panel, the expert advisory panel. Your response to this from you know, the perspective, you run a fund, yeah? Tell us about the Aberdeen, what's it, uh, the um, uh, Financial Fairness Trust. And Sure, so the, the trust is really about trying to improve living standards for those on low to middle incomes. And we've got particular focus on Scotland. Um, so it's, you know, a lot of the work which is emphasized here is central to what we do. Um, I really welcome this report. It really provides a detailed overview and there's lots of these background papers as well as Dave um, said earlier. I think for me, what it uh, highlights is that really gains are possible. Um, we saw that particularly in the in the first uh, half of a period that this um, report looks at, um, but those uh, really have stalled and in, in some areas have gone backwards and that's really quite shocking. And whilst I did know quite a lot of the data, uh, which was there, I'm not a health expert, but the one which really shocked me more than anything else was this um, fall in life expectancy in such a short space of time. So um, 4.4 years less in under a decade for, for those born in 2012, which is, you know, a huge drop. What I really liked about the report was wow. the focus on socioeconomic factors um, and the acknowledgement that they do a lot of the heavy lifting. And too often what we hear about health is, let's just fund the health service, which we really do need to do, or uh, individual behaviours, and that being the a way that we're going to resolve this. And I think the context in which it, this place is, um, the, these gaps in um, uh, health inequalities, the wage stagnation that we've seen since 2008, the impact of austerity, the cost of living crisis, all of this is quite really a very strong thread running through, through the report. Mm -hmm. um, and I also really liked the, um, uh, the re-emphasising the key principles from the Christie Commission, this idea that we've got to involve um, people that are not just uh, passive recipients of health services, that they need to be central to this, the focus on prevention, the idea that we need to have partnership working, evaluating performance, and also this really long-term emphasis that we need. But the thing that really worries me, so whilst I've said lots of positives, it's the sort of implementation gap that the report identifies, and how this will translate into practice. So often we have these big reports which come out and uh, the, the report itself identifies lots of other reports which have come before that. And then it's kind of like, okay, what do we do with it and how do we make sure that we translate some of this into practice? Thank you very much. I want to pick up a couple of comments that have come in that are relevant to, to what you've just said. Andrew Moran is saying, from an economics point of view, were these impacts known or expected when austerity was proposed? Did policymakers know or expect this may happen? Um, you know, are these figures a surprise to ministers? I, I don't think I can expect you to answer that, but I think it's it's reflecting there. And Jerry McCartney is saying he's a little confused why the uh, uh, report foregrounds the implementation gap as key to understanding why health inequalities are getting worse. Um, arguably policy has been implemented very successfully, austerity policy, and that's resulted in the unsurprising rise in socioeconomic and health inequalities. Mubin Hart, do you think that um, this will be a surprise to anyone who's making these political decisions? I wonder if I can ask you that. You can always decline to answer. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it's, it's a really interesting one. I don't think when the government was doing this, it was expecting, and I'm talking about UK government here, um, was expecting that this would be, well, this was not their intention. Mm. Now, I think if you do make these cuts, anyone who's been involved in this area long enough, you will know that 
you were going to have some serious consequences to people's financial security and including to their health. So it shouldn't have come as a complete surprise. I don't think uh, we're saying that there's a direct causal link between that, but there really is a lot of evidence saying that it's had a huge impact uh, on, on, on people's, uh, uh, on a, a variety of health indicators. So in some ways, none of this is surprising. You know, we really, do, and the fact that we're going through a cost of living crisis at the moment really emphasizes the need to have much greater investment than we currently are. We'll come to that later, I'm sure. I'm sure we're, we can sort of remember that we're, we're focusing very much in the next bit about so what now, but I'm still after Michael Kellett, I'm going to come to you, your response to this report. Now, you're Director of Strategy, Governance and Performance at Public Health Scotland. You've worked, you know, deeply inside the Scottish Government. Um, we've been talking about this for an awfully long time. Do you think it's come as a surprise to anyone before I get to your reactions to the report? <laughs> I really don't think it has come as a surprise to anyone, Penny. Uh, thanks for that question. I think, as Linda and Mubin have said, um, I think the real value in the report is adding serious weight. Uh, it's a serious addition to the evidence base that we knew already about uh, where things were with, with health inequalities in Scotland. Um, but no, it's, it's not a surprise. The key thing for me is, OK, on the basis of the support and others, the Health and Support Committee, what, what do we do about it? What do we do that's different? What do we do that changes the dial? And I, I welcome the chance to get into that discussion today. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pick up another point that's been made here. There's a lot of discussion in Q&A and thank you very much for that and on the chat feed. Um, a, a key message from the, the review really has been, and Linda, if I could come to you on this. Um, you mentioned working across sectors in prevention, that perhaps there's been too much kind of siloed thinking about inequalities, you know, has it been disconnected across government? Um, this question is, do you see social prescribing presenting an opportunity for this? And does that need more investment and support? Let's pick up the investment and support question first. Yeah, so if we start with investment and support, I mean, I, th I think Jerry McCartney's comments on this, and you'll see them in the chat, are, uh, you know, as usual, spot on. Um, the, the root cause of, of the, the worsening of some of these outcomes is austerity. It's, it's underinvestment. The real-term decline in the value of Social Security for those who need it most is serious. The block grant for Scotland, as the report sets out, is just only now returned to 2010 levels. You know, there's less money in the system. And the new Social Security uh, benefits that are being provided in Scotland are, of course, important, but they're really only going to scratch the surface of what it, people need. So I think that is the fundamental thing. And I think the implementation gap, though, is really relevant. And in terms of social prescribing specifically, Penny, um, there is promise there. What we need to do is not regard the health service as the solution to these problems, because it's not. Last night I was looking at the Commonwealth Fund reports again for something else. You know, the proportion of GDP that we spend on healthcare is not that different to some of the countries that perform fundamentally differently. And the, the, the difference in those countries is that they've invested in prevention in a different way. So they have healthier populations. So I think if we can, and social prescribing is relevant here, do more in more places to support people, particularly in the early years of life, um, then I think that will make a difference. But the bottom line is we need to provide more resources to individuals um, because we know that it's just so strongly linked to health. Thank you very much. Michael Kellett. You know, we've been working, we've been addressing these issues in Scotland, or at least talking about addressing these issues in Scotland for decades. What can be done differently now from your perspective in, in Public Health Scotland? We absolutely, we yeah, we absolutely have Penny be talking about these issues for decades. And that's where I think the spotlight that the support has shown on that implementation gap is, is really powerful and really important. And it's really a call to arms for, for, for people like me and others working across public services in Scotland to, to think uh, differently. I, I don't want to be 
living in a society, bringing my children up in a society with some of the inequalities that David described around drug mm -hmm. deaths, around infant mortality. And, and I think we all have a, a shared role in, in tackling uh, some of that. For me, Penny, what the report said around the need for collaboration, mm -hmm. the need for empowering communities, the need for addressing what are fundamental inequalities in income, wealth and power in our society are at, at the root of what, what we need to do here. And I, I agree with Linda. I think this isn't, uh, the NHS uh, can't solve the, the challenges that the report has faced. It has an important role. Of course it has, but all public services, the third sector, the private sector uh, as well, need to come together in a, in a different way to uh, address uh, some of these issues in the longer term. I also agree with Linda about the focus on early years and, and children and, and young people is, is absolutely fundamental. Uh, we know uh, life chances uh, can be baked in very early in life and we need to address that. We had a committee meeting in Public Health Scotland yesterday where we focus on our work on uh, children, young people and addressing child poverty. Uh, we need to do uh, more of that. And from a Public Health Scotland perspective, our role is in trying to convene, bring uh, colleagues together across sectors, not just in health, but it's also about bringing actionable intelligence and data to bear to help us to address these issues. And is there going to be a new energy around that as a result of this work, for instance? I, I, I certainly think there is, Penny. And one of the things, and certainly this is the case in Public Health Scotland, but I think for public services as a whole, we're not, COVID isn't behind us. COVID will always uh, remain, but we're in a different position now in terms of the pandemic. And certainly in terms of Public Health Scotland, and I think for other public services too, the work in government around the COVID recovery strategy, there's a chance to look ahead and think about how we do things different. That's certainly something we're embracing. We published a new forward-looking three-year strategy at the end of last year, and we're seeking to be a good partner working with colleagues right across public, third and private sector to advance this agenda moving forward. Okay, thank you. Now we've got really energetic responses and discussions going on on the various forums here. So forgive me if I'm you know, not catching everything that's being commented upon. But I want to pick up, um, before I come back to Chris to get a response, um, David Finch with you. Joanne Smithson's raised the issue of research and insight on people's personal subjective well-being is what she's referring to here. Um, now, this report was informed by public members, yeah? I've heard very strongly that it's gonna take us all to address this. Do people get it, David? Because that's gonna drive political decision-making. I'm gonna to come to Chris on that. Sure, and I think on Joanne's um, specific point about the types of measures used, that the, um, it's, it, be good to read through the um, the Glasgow report where they have looked at what measures are available um, and, there, and that was a good sort of place to look a bit more but the the point on the public participation so we you know we we had a a, um, a piece of research that was looking at um, but which was um, aiming to do public participation and it was designed really to have a deliberative process with a it was a, a group of around um, 25 people to, to speak to them about health inequalities and understand their perspectives. And I think what was really interesting with that process is how they started from a, a point of really prioritising things like healthcare services, um, perhaps as you might expect. But as they um, you know, discussed the um, discussed the issues more um, and evidence was shared with them, and we had um, some experts come in to, to speak to them as well, they really started to understand and prioritise more of the wider factors, the social and economic factors that can influence health. And I think they also really got the need for actually taking a longer term approach. So the idea that you need to focus only on short term kind of acute healthcare needs in to, to target health inequalities, I think that showed, really showed that actually there's public support there to go for a, more, a longer term approach if they're given the right information, if, if, if the information is presented in, in ways that, that encourages people to engage with it, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I think that was part of the process. I mean, I think, obviously, it would be hard, I think, to run that type of intensive process with everybody, but I'm sure, I think there are ways in which you can improve the ways we talk about health um, and you know, the things that um, people prioritise, what governments prioritise, um, you know, change that language so that actually people start to more readily accept um, a different approach. Yeah. Uh, Frankie McPherson is uh, saying, and I'm going to come to Chris, if I may.
Thank you, McPherson, saying also wondering how important further investment and support for the NHS in Scotland will be and how much further the government and NHS Scotland should be going in terms of action plans and support beyond their recovery strategy. That's a question about the NHS, but actually what your review very clearly says is this cuts across all policy in Scotland, Chris, yeah? How do we, you know, how do we shift the debate away from purely health and health outcomes and impacts on A&E to the longer term health benefits for us as a country? I mean, we're talking 4.4 years less of life for a baby born now, basically, than a baby born 10 years ago. Sure, thanks. Um, thanks, Penny. And, and just briefly on, on the implementation gap issue, because I think it's, it's important to address it. So, um, <clears throat> and, you know, Linda's responded to, 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 to Jerry's point. And the implementation gap is foregrounded in this report because tens of people, tens of stakeholders told us it was a, it was a really serious issue. Um, I, I, I don't think we're necessarily suggesting that the implementation gap is the cause of health inequalities. Um, uh, but uh, what we are foregrounding and what people did foreground when we, when we spoke to them is that despite very strong policy intent in Scotland, these gaps are still widening. Um, so, um, it, you know, and that came up time um, and time again, and, and it's mirrored in, 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 in the work of the, 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 the health and social care and and sport committee. So, so that's why the implementation gap is, is foregrounded in this report. And I do think it, you know, it does then raise the question, as you say, you know, what do we do? Um, the health, social care and sport committees report, which was, you know, it's timely, it was happening at the same time um, uh, 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 as, 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 our, uh, as our review was, was, was taking place, rightly, I think, focuses on the need for a kind of much more coordinated whole government approach. But this is this is not just about government. It's not just about what's happening at national level, and it's not just about uh, health. Um, it's it's you know th this isn't just about policy choices. It's actually about social change, um, uh, and it's about uh, uh, local communities. It's about businesses. It's about citizens. And I think on that point that Dave was making about do people get it. Um, and he's talked about the, 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 the Diffley research that contributed to this review. That's backed up by attitudinal data. I think the public do get it. Increasingly, the public gets it. Um, and actually, you know, we have to, you, you know, we have to collectively respond to that pull, um, if you like, uh, uh, that's there. People, are, you know, the public understand that, that poverty um, is a very significant cause of health inequalities. Um, and, and we have to respond to that. And although it involves us all and will take us all, the politics does drive priorities and can facilitate or not um, driving this agenda through Chris Cregan. Um, do you think that, that we've, you know, longer term thinking, do you think it remains a challenge for politicians in Scotland? Let's stick with that right now. Yeah, sure. No, I, absolutely. I, I, I think it does. Um, and, and a question, that's not a new problem. It's, and it's not unique to, to, to this issue. Um, that said, and just before I, I, you know, say some more about this, I think it's kind of easy um, to uh, bash politicians, whilst at the same time contributing to the short termism in our own um, expectations and, and the way we lobby uh, politicians and what we expect from politicians and the decisions they make. So I think there's a question about how we create the conditions in which our expectations are the right ones, are achievable, are, are realistic. Um, I, I don't buy, and this is sometimes said about the health service, I don't buy the argument that you take politics out of, out of the arguments. Um, Darren McGarvey, and I quote him in my foreword to this report, he points out in his latest book um, that this is, you know, this is about profoundly political choices. So it's not about taking politics out, it's about politics, putting politics in, I think. Um, 
I, I, I think it's about not, so it's not about not doing politics, it's about doing politics differently. And it's something that came up in the in the work that the Diffley associates did. Um, the public do want politicians to to cooperate. They do want um, to see a greater focus on uh, what 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 we can do together um, and on consensus. And I think you know one of the things I've said consistently. I've said it in relation to mental health, for example. Um, there's something about matching our consensus of aspiration with a consensus of implementation. We see consensus of aspiration all the time in the mental health space, we see it over and over. But when it comes to implementation, it all breaks down. Time scales, budgets, investment choices, that's where the consensus breaks down. And, 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 and we have to get over that. I think it's, not, it's also not a choice between short and long-term approaches. It's, they're not mutually exclusive. It's about how they work together. Uh, and it's about short-term, uh, uh, responding to short-term uh, crises in a way that contributes to, to, to the, 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 as foundational to longer-term change. Yeah, thank you. Moving Hark, given Aberdeen Financial Fairness Trust, um, uh, you, in your experience, how, do you think, for instance, corporate business Scotland connects to this? We've heard about public perceptions of austerity. Do you think in other spheres um, uh, inequality is high enough up on agendas? Um, well, well, I should add that one. we're not that closely connected to the um, corporate entity that is Aberdeen PLC, so I can't hugely comment on that. But employers have a, a, a huge um, role to play in terms of uh, incomes in particular. And uh, one of the things we've highlighted is the huge wage stagnation that there's been uh, for over a decade. And we're seeing that even more so with the current cost of living crisis, that wages just really aren't keeping pace with inflation. Um, and there are choices there to be made. We did an interesting report with a high pay centre uh, last year about um, you know who actually does get the share of the cake in terms of wages and where does that go and unfortunately too much of that's going to the very top and not enough to those uh, at the bottom or the middle um, but you know we've we've got real choices that we can make about where we're at and none of this is inevitable and I think we've got we've had two really interesting examples recently um, one was austerity, which we've touched on, where, as the report highlights, we cut out £3.7 billion a year from the Social Security budget, which is a huge amount, having a real impact on people's daily lives. And that's people out of work and in work. And then we had the pandemic, where actually, in the main, we really did support people in terms of their finances. The furlough scheme, self-employment uh, grants, uh, help with loans. There was a huge amount of support provided by government in particular, UK and Scottish, by employers, by uh, banks, by lots of, by landlords in terms of um, how incomes could be protected. And what we found through our survey, so we do a, did a big survey with YouGov of 6,000 households, and we've had this consistently since the start of the pandemic, is that those who are in serious financial difficulties, it remained about 10% during the pandemic. It did not rise. Um, since the cost of living crisis, that's now risen from 10% to 17%, and more recently to 21%. And that's because a current uh, response from government, UK government in particular, has been wholly inadequate. And so those are the policy choices we have in terms of do we help people, particularly those who are on low to middle incomes, or do, and that's what we did during the pandemic, we really helped everyone, or do we just get leave people adrift? And that has an impact on their longer term uh, health indicators. Uh, well, I, I'd love to ask you what helping people would look like, but we've got a comment here from Dean Mayer saying we need uh, to be bolder to impact on entrenched health, health inequalities. And uh, talking about universal basic income, I'm moving how can you know, 
very briefly, I wonder, would you support that? Is that the kind of intervention moving on to the so what now? What can we do? I think, uh, you know, I've got sort of probably mixed views in terms of universal basic, basic income, but overall, we really do need to boost incomes. And one of the policy ideas a uh, um, government is taking forward, and this has got cross party support in Scotland, is this idea of a minimum income guarantee. It's a fact that uh, households, people should not fall below a certain income. And I think that's a really, really positive move because we know that Social Security in particular does not provide an adequate safety net. It's been paired to the bone. It's, you know, that £20 uplift that we saw during uh, the pandemic, that was taken away. And all of these little add-ons that have come on since have been totally inadequate. Okay. So the minimum income guarantee is kind of a, another way of kind of really focusing on those who actually do need uh, uh, extra yeah. resource. Okay. And that's going to be a combination through social security and wages. Let me let me go to Linda Bold, if I may. Irene Kroll has put this question to you as well, specifically in the Q&A. Um, providing more resources to individuals is the key, uh, suggesting U UBI, universal ba basic income, would be a good way to approach this. What do you think about that concept? So, you be, I mean, UBI, all, I think um, a minimum income guarantee, um, as we were just hearing, the evidence is pretty good for that. Universal basic income is also promising, but all of these alternatives have weaknesses to them. So if you look at the evidence, which is largely from, I think it's Sweden or Norway, or, and certainly the pilot they did in Wales, um, it doesn't always get to the people who might need it most. And you need to think about larger families, smaller families. So, but I, I, what I would say is thinking about changes to our social safety net is absolutely got to be on the cards. But the bottom line is, given what we've observed over the last decade, we need to have more for the groups that need it most. And that would mean basic things like increasing our existing social security and, and, and also major problems, Penny, like the five week wait that people have to get universal credit. These are all fundamental issues. Can I just, sorry, now that I'm speaking, take advantage very, very briefly of just the, the comment about companies and employers. Yeah. So they have yeah. a hugely important role to play in addressing inequalities and improving public health. But we live in a, a liberal democracy where the profit motive is also killing people. I would say this, and you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> there are some companies that are producing products which are directly harming health. And we've not talked about obesity and the report is not about individual behavior, but, it, but overweight and obesity is not just about individual behavior. That's causing major damage, particularly to our most deprived communities. So in terms of bold action, we need to think also of, about policies that will address those commercial determinants of health. And that's not talked about in the report, and I regard it as a big gap, um, and it's another important issue. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Kedder, if I could come to you. So Public Health Scotland, you know, actually, maybe if we just throw enough money at this, as we did at COVID, for instance, would that solve our problems, Michael? I suppose the first thing to say, Penny, and we've seen that in press reports this morning, is the money isn't there. To, to do that, the, the, I, can't, I think it was the IFS report this morning that showed that the, the financial constraint the Scottish Government is going to be under over the, the, the next few years. So, so we need to uh, be cognizant of that. I, 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 of course, we need to invest in lots of what we've talked about today, I think is around kind of changing the nature of, of investment. But we need to be clear about the money we already invest. Uh, one of the things I think we need to be clear about, and, and again, I don't think it was mentioned in the report, but but there's evidence about the inverse care law. Uh, and of course, this isn't, this isn't about just health services, yeah. but we know that those most in need of receiving health services sometimes get get, get the least in terms of the provision. Uh, and Carrie Newman has posted about well, that. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I missed that, but I think that's a, a real issue for us. So there's something about, uh, but for me, it's about, um, how we uh, organise our, ourselves uh, across our society. Are we prepared to uh, empower communities? One of the, the conclusions that, that David highlighted from the report in a way that, that does things differently, that perhaps takes risks. Uh, I agree with what colleagues said. We can't take the politics out of this agenda. That would be uh, naive in the extreme. But are we prepared as a society to think about 
what would a, a different approach like look like in local areas? One of the things in, in Public Health Scotland we are keen to do is add value nationally, but bringing that actionable data and intelligence that I talked about, but also supporting uh, local action to improve health and to tackle health inequalities. And, and for me, I think one of the things we need to collectively think about is could we do something differently in a locality basis to empower communities uh, and, and take away some of the constraints that I was just looking at page 63 of the report and it talks about um, uh, uh, the constraints uh, of highly burdensome and constrictive uh, uh, requirements uh, from policy makers and, and policy funders uh, on local communities. That's something I think we can address and, and we need to move forward. Thank you. And as ever, there are nuances to all these issues. Jerry McCartney has posted, can the evidence that community empowerment is an effective means of reducing health inequalities be described? Empowering what communities to make what decisions to change what? Um, and I suppose, Chris, to me, that comes back, I suppose, to this implementation gap question. We've got language around this that's been used quite blithely over the decades without necessarily seeing positive benefits. Um, do you think we need further work? There's, there's deeper research required here on questions just like that. So, you know, I, I think Jerry's right to raise that point. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't think community empowerment or local, none of these things, are, they're, it's not a, they're not a panacea. Um, but I think it's undoubtedly the case um, that this isn't, this isn't a problem that government and public policy can solve um, on its own. Um, and so government has a role to play. Um, the public sector has a role to play um, in a facilitative, leading, trailblazing sense. But actually, you know, because this is a social problem, um, we're going to have to resolve it community by community, family by family, locality by locality, business by business, institution by institution. So, so government, national infrastructure, you know, ha has a really important role in creating the space in which that happens. But it's something that has to be informed and owned on the ground. And, uh, you know, yes, uh, you know, community empowerment uh, is not uh, a panacea, but I do think local is critical to this. And there's another report that came out um, at the same time as ours um, from, from our Scottish future, which talks about the importance of equipping local people with decision-making powers, with financial tools, with data insight that can uh, lead to long-term solutions. And I do think, and, and this is something else that's coming up in the chat, there's a, a concern about, you know, are we the same old voices, same old think tanks, same old, same old, same old. Um, you know, I'd be really concerned um, if, if that's um, all we were doing. I don't think that is all we're doing. And I do think um, that, of course, uh, when we talk about local, when we talk about community, that does mean those with lived experience, it's not an expression I particularly like, but those with lived experience and those working most closely with them, um, supporting them, um, around them, absolutely have to be part and parcel of the work that goes on in collaborating with communities and, and, and on the ground. Thank you very much. And it's great to see Michael Kelly You're nodding your head there, Linda, you too. Um, uh, I wonder if I could pick up something else as well, as well as, you know, how do we do community empowerment properly and quickly? Because we're addressing the so what now? We, we haven't really got time to waste, do we, Linda? No, we don't, Penny. And sorry, I was looking at the chat. I, I think yeah. we don't have time to waste. And I think... Um, in relation to community empower and the empowerment and the implementation gap, there is, and I, you know, Jerry's right, the, yeah, it's hard to find the hard evidence, but in the areas where things progress well and real change is made in anchor institutions or implementing policies, the community are involved and there is trust. And I do think there is a mismatch, and you can see that in the webinar chat, sometimes between national policies and local action. Yeah, And some of that is about the relationship, as you know, Penny, from all your years uh, looking at health and issues around that, the relationship between national and local government, 
the funding for the third sector. You know, these are huge, huge issues that we haven't addressed. I don't have the answers to them, but um, they are fundamental. And I think that speaks to some of the recommendations in the report. Let's provide good support to the third sector. There are moves to provide longer term funding. Let's try and address this often difficult relationship between national and local government. Um, and, the, and, and also make sure that local government and the third sector and national government are engaging with communities. And um, so these are things that will be part of the picture. Rather muddled answer, but just to say I agree. Yeah, thank you. And Michael Kellett, we've had a question here. Income is one social determinant of health. What about housing? And it was great to see housing highlighted in the report, you know, there are real concerns about housing stock right now. I mean, for instance, that, that plays directly into this, doesn't it, from a public health perspective? It, it absolutely does. Housing and, and uh, people having secure, warm, affordable housing is, is clearly a, a key social determinant of health. And, and, and I, I mean, I said in my first contribution, I think real at root here, we're talking about inequalities of wealth and income and power and, and housing kind of plays into that as well. So I, I think you're right, Penny, and that's why that uh, working together, government, housing providers in localities working together to, to tackle some of that uh, uh, agenda is hugely important. It's a, it's a strong determinant of health. We, we know that. Huge investment over many years to improve the quality of our housing stock in, in, in Scotland, I know. But some real issues issues still remain, of course. And again, collective action is is going to be the only way to uh, to improve that. Yeah, thank you. Now, the, the, somebody's commented, uh, Frankie McPherson, saying, you know, there are good things happening. Um, are there any particular short term approaches that have been proven to be working? Could be, you know, the, I think the report, David, made a real emphasis on 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 sharing, I don't want to use the phrase best practice because it's another buzz phrase, but, you know, what works, rolling it out. Is that is that a problem right across public policy areas? I mean, I think it's a problem. I suppose it goes back to some of the things we we're talking about earlier around short termism as well. I mean, I, th I think it's it's an issue within within parts of Scotland and different across different policy areas. Um, I think the thing that came through quite clearly was also almost a constraint on that people felt a constraint on the ability to actually do the innovation in the first place to try and find that kind of a, a better way of working. And that's one of those things that we think is important is you know, trying to enable those conditions that will allow people to try and do more with, with, with within existing structures. What does that take? Because we need quick responses to this, don't we? We don't need necessarily simply more research that's going to take decades. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I and I think that's where um, it's why where some of our focus on implementation and delivery comes in. Because I think you know, there's this it's all too much a risk that we give into fatalism and believe these outcomes are inevitable. I think, or you know, our hands are tied to do anything. I mean, there's clearly constraints. There's a, a, there's there's a lack of political cooperation with you know Scotland and the rest of the UK not necessarily moving or not going in the same direction on issues. Um, and you know, and no one's suggesting that any of the things we're talking about today on their own will resolve the issue. And I think it'd be very naive to think that it was. But I do think, um, you know, there's clearly an issue here that it is possible to to do more within existing structures, try and adapt and change those structures and make progress on changing health inequalities. And I think if we don't take that action now and do something practical to to try and improve improve the situation and improve delivery, then you know there's a real danger that um, and real life costs that um, in failing to deliver, or to think that we're powerless to try and do that delivery. Yeah, thank you very much. I wonder whether I can go round the, the the members of our panel here and ask, you know, if there was a magic wand and you could do one thing right now, the what now question to shift this, to make this move in ways that we haven't been able necessarily to achieve in recent years, what would it be? Linda, I'm gonna to come to you first. <laughs> uh, so I think it, it really is about incomes. So I, you know, the key thing for me would be income and resources 
improving our social security system, increasing the real value of working uh, for people who are working and out of work of benefits. But the, it, within that, Penny, what I would focus on would be child poverty. And we are trying to do that, but I don't think we're doing it at scale. There's much, much more that we could do. And that the last question you've got in the Q&A from Professor Sarah Curtis speaks to that. Like focused on the most disadvantaged young people and the adverse experiences that that poverty brings with it, which are multifaceted, that will help carry them through the life course. And so that would be, and, and is the, my priority. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, move in the hack for you. Magic one time. Um, you, you might get some similar answers here, but I think I'd agree with Linda. It, it's all to do with incomes. It's so central. I mean, even this housing question, it's so connected to that, you know, if you don't have the money, then you can't have, you can't put the heating on, you are living in mouldy and damp conditions, you have uh, limited choices for where you can live. Um, so incomes and boosting that is really critical. We've made some really good progress, I should say, on things like the minimum wage and, and the living wage um, over the last uh, couple of decades. So none of this is inevitable in terms of where we are, where we are. But the social security safety net that we have is just absolutely crap. And going back to what Linda said, which was, you know, about um, other countries not spending more on health services, that's absolutely true. And they've got better health outcomes. And that's because they have a much better wraparound safety net than we do. Just look at Finland. I was, you know, I've been talking to Danny Dawling recently and his work there in terms of looking at their situation. And we are just so far behind because we've got a very siloed view in terms of how we deal with some of these issues. But incomes, wealth inequalities, these are all critical in terms of, you know, tackling uh, uh, these health outcomes that we want to uh, address. So if we really mean this in Scotland, we have to underpin this with hard cash, moving hard, yeah, in a word? Uh, yeah, it's gotta be hard cash. It can't be, you know, about food banks. I mean, you know, we saw, we've seen a huge growth in food banks. You know, the Trussell Trust was set up to try and address uh, issues going on in Eastern Europe. And somehow there are now, more food banks, double the number of food banks, and there are McDonald's yeah. in this country. That's, that's dreadful. Let me pick up, before I go to Michael for his response to that, Teresa Glasgow posting, there's no time to waste. We need to provide an atmosphere of safety, bravery and compassion in gathering sectors together to share, addressing health literacy. I mean, so many targets. Michael, if you, and no doubt in your role in, Public Health Scotland, you do have a magic wand. What do we need to do first? If only I had a magic uh, wand, uh, Penny, I'd, I'd love to have one. Uh, I, I agree with what colleagues have said. I mean, my honestly, before Linda said that, I was going to say child poverty too. I think if we could get behind the child poverty strategy that government published, uh, I was going to say earlier this year, uh, last year, Bright Start, Bright Futures, and really focus on that as a putting the whole might of, of Scotland right across private, public and independent sectors, that that would be uh, that would be my kind of wish. The other thing I, I think we do need to think about Penny, and it's maybe cheeky taking another shot, R Linda raised that and I agree with her. I think in the longer term, we need to think about regulation too. Can we do more on alcohol? Can we do more on smoking? Can we do more on diet and use the regulatory powers of government to do that? I know government's considering that, uh, and I think that that will be really important. We've done minimum unit pricing. We've done the smoking ban in Scotland. I'm sure there's more we can do in that area. It's not a panacea, but I think it's an important contribution to some of this. In, in a word, Michael, is radical. Is more, much more radical action required in this country right now on the, all these fronts? I think bravery and boldness is is required absolutely, and I think that goes into that regulatory space. But it goes more broadly about how we come together across public services, how we come together nationally and locally. And, and, and as I say, the child poverty strategy might be a vehicle for, for doing that and really concentrating how we can uh, come together collectively uh, to deliver on that hugely important agenda. Thank you. We've had so many amazing comments, both in the Q&A and the chat that I know will be captured. 
um, will uh, feed into future thinking. But just in the last few minutes, I'm going to turn to David Finch, if I may. What happens now? Is this just another report that gathers dust on somebody's shelf and gets referred to the next time there's a review? I think that was that was a phrase used quite often throughout the uh, throughout the process, and it was always the aim not to end up in that situation. I mean, you know, we we always recognised um, doing this work in Scotland that there was already, you know, there was already a wealth of evidence, a wealth of, of policy, um, and it was really a question not so much of um, kind of trying to highlight the issue of health inequalities because I think people were all too aware, but to really understand you know, why has there been this. Um, Kind of lack of progress, and as the discussion today has shown, um, you know, there's a broad range of reasons for that. But we are really keen to be able to, um, particularly because of the, I suppose, the the enthusiasm and engagement we've had through this process, to to try and do something um, and support some activity in future in Scotland that helps to um, that helps to make progress. And clearly, um, I suppose this funding a new social security system is probably not the um, place we can go to but what we are keen to do is help focus on some of that um, collaborative action thinking about ways we can help um, um, policy makers and, and policy deliverers um, do that more effectively across across an issue potentially um, I'm sure there are some issues in child poverty or early years and thinking about how if we can take a particular issue and really work with people to um, to understand what's getting in the way of greater progress within that and also think about um some of these um the kind of how we can help to learn better from existing existing policy interventions and um and improve that learning so we're very keen to um to, to take this a step further and look at some practical solutions that that will that will make a difference and also very open to, to listening to people's ideas and suggestions and um, and views on what that could look like as well in in the coming weeks and months Oh, right. And how can people, you know, I'm looking here at these fantastic stream of messages, pointers. How can people connect with that work wherever we're coming from, be the members of the public or whoever? We have, um, we, we do have a, I mean, the easiest thing is an email address ultimately. So we can, I mean, I think we can drop that into the, the chat so we can share that with people as well. And in, and in the, and in the, Following the webinar, we will send out a communication to share the, the recording and things as well, so we can people can get in touch through that too. Thank you. And then to come to Chris Cregan in the last very few minutes, Chris, sounds like um, we need a bit of a movement here. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, I would. I absolutely would. And um, so just, just to come back to my magic wand, I suppose, because you didn't come to me on that penny, um, uh, I agree with everybody else's magic wands. And I do think... I suppose there's a, you know, there's a challenge actually because prioritization um, and focus um, is really critical. So, um, but but I did have one, um, and and mine was around preventative spend and the shift to preventative spend. We haven't got to grips with that. We absolutely have to get to grips with that, and that's in relation to um, health, but it's also in relation to other um, social determinants. Um, so whether that's, you know, investment in in uh, social housing, whether or not that's preventative spend relating to supported employment and employment practices. So that shifts to prevention, which we've talked about, um, but we haven't uh, got to grips with. And as, as of commentators have, 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 have rightly said, you know, there's lots of it in the chat. I don't disagree with it. The evidence is is there. The evidence is absolutely there. Um, I think this report. Um, uh, and this review uh, actually underlines and confirms the evidence. It doesn't um, dispute it. So it is possible. Um, we don't have a choice. Um, it, it, what this report, what this review does is it, it sets out a, a, a challenge. Um, and and I, I'm delighted that the Health Foundation is committed to investing in, 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 in further investment in this work. And um, I think that has to be action focused. It has to be collaboration focused. You know, I really welcome that. We said all the way through this, but we weren't just going to kind of lob a report over a wall and run away. And I, at the reception last week in Parliament, and, you know, this isn't just about what happens in Parliament, it's about what happens countrywide, but I did sense a real, you know, strong sense of, 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 of enthusiasm, of shared purpose, of shared commitment, but also shared anxiety and shared frustration that we're not getting this right, that 
that we have to get this right. So there's a fair wind. Um, we won't all agree on everything, and that's clear from the chat as well. But I think there's a lot um, that we that we can agree on. We're in uh, a dissemination phase, if you like, uh, of this process now. Um, but I don't think that has a that's not a passive kind of one directional process. It has to be um, an engagement uh, phase, and it has to be about engaging on solutions. I do think, finally, I do think there's a lesson from COVID here. COVID was a crisis. COVID arguably still is a crisis. Um, we had to stop what we were doing and respond to it. And in doing so, we had to do things differently. And actually, we proved in many ways that we could. Um, and so this is a crisis. We talked a lot about Build Back Better. Um, haven't heard that uh, for a while. Um, but we do have to respond to this as a crisis, we have to up the pace of change. We have to try stuff. Um, if it doesn't work, uh, we have to own up to that. We have to ditch it. We have to take a different approach. And I think that's where the maturity comes in. So we know, uh, as people have said, what the evidence is about what we need to do. But when we do it, we need to evaluate. We need to learn from it. We need to scrutinize. Um, I'm, you know, finally, um, I'm reminded of something that Mary Robinson said in relation to climate change a couple of years back. Um, she said, um, all of us have to make climate change personal in our lives. We have to get angry, we have to get active, we have to disrupt, and we have to imagine the world we're hurrying towards. And I think there's wisdom in those words that apply to the scenario that we're confronting here. And coming back to the money, the money question, um, the, your review makes very strong points about the cost of not addressing this. Is this a case of investing to save, Chris? You know, would you advocate investing in prevention to save resources down the line? Absolutely. And, and you know, that's why, you know, I mean, I'd like other people's magic ones, but that's why I highlighted um, prevention. And it's there in, in other reports that have been produced by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and others is is absolutely critical and 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 yes, you know austerity um, has had a, a really dramatic effect uh, on the fragility of our public services, but that doesn't mean, as Michael and others have said, that there isn't still scope there to do things differently. Um, and 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 I think you know I see that we see that. Um, so it isn't just about spending more; it's about spending better. Now we've got so many more questions coming in. These are going to have to be picked up separately. But um, Chris Cregan, to give you the last word, and before we wrap up proceedings here, are you optimistic? Do you really believe that this is possible to reverse this decline? Rookie error. I was on mute. Um, I thought I'd had the last word. Actually, was why I put I put the mute another on. Another one. <laughs> um, I, I, I always describe myself, Penny, as a glass half empty optimist. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, I'm anxious. I'm frustrated. Um, but 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 I also believe in the possibility of change, and we've seen that it can happen across a, a, a wealth of other issues um, over the years. Uh, so so I'm optimistic uh, that that we can work together, that we can collaborate, that we can use this as a moment um, uh, uh, to, to to respond to this issue. But I do think, as I said just now, you know, it, it, it is a crisis, um, and I think we have to treat it as a crisis. Um, and that, that's, that's the kind of, that's, that's the level of boldness that we need to inject into our response to this. Thank you so much. We could keep on talking about this for hours, but we're coming up to our deadline. I would like to thank so much all the people that have contributed to this discussion today. Your comments, your questions, absolutely spot on and superb. I'd like to thank very much fantastic uh, panel here as well and I wish you every luck in finally let's get this going Scotland thank you <laughs>